Let's try a couple further applications of the cylindrical volume formula. Consider cylinder 1 and cylinder 3 from our previous examples. If you recall, cylinder 1 has a diameter of 5 inches and a height of 20 inches, whereas cylinder 3 has got a diameter of 12 inches and a height of 24 inches. Let's say we take cylinder 1 and we fill it to the brim with 392.7 cubic inches of the delicious Mexican cinnamon rice beverage, or chata. Cylinder 3 is empty. My question to you is this. What would happen if I empty the entire contents of cylinder 1 into presently empty cylinder 3? What happens? Does it fill entirely? Does it overflow? Or is cylinder 3 only partially filled? You'll note cylinder 3 is considerably larger than cylinder 1, so it stands to conjecture it will only be partially filled. Think about what I'm asking here. Given the liquids conform to the shape of their container, what's the height of this cylinder with a known volume and a known area? After all, it's spreading out over the known area of cylinder 3. Given volume equals area times height, one would solve for unknown height in terms of known area and volume by isolating unknown height on one side of the equation using the following steps. Divide both sides by A. A cancels out and we're left with height equals volume divided by area. Substituting in the known volume of 397.2 cubic inches and the known area of cylinder 3 of 113.1 square inches into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates this same quantity of horchata only rises to a height of 3.4 inches given it's spread over a much larger surface area. Makes sense, right? It's the same volume of liquid and it doesn't fill a larger container nearly as much. Here's another application of cylindrical volume formula. Consider an empty cylinder with a diameter of 6 inches and height of 16 inches. Consider another smaller cylinder, this one however composed of solid steel with a diameter of 3.5 inches and also a height of 16 inches. Take the smaller solid steel cylinder and put it inside the larger empty cylinder. What's the volume of the remaining tube-like space? This is kind of like the 3D version of the ring area problem and uses similar techniques to solve of which there are two methods. First, one determines the volume of the larger exterior cylinder. Then one determines the volume of the smaller interior cylinder. To determine the volume of the remaining tube-like space, one would subtract the volume of the interior from the exterior. Volume of the tube equals exterior minus interior. If you don't like that technique, here's another way of doing it. Think back to the earlier illustrated example that examined the area of the ring-like shape formed by the overlapping a larger circle and a smaller interior circle. The area of the ring was the area of the outer minus the area of the inner. What if we simply took the area of the ring and multiplied it by height? I've got a reasonable degree of confidence this would also yield the volume of the remaining tube-like space. Let's see if both methods work. An application of the circular surface area formula suggests the larger exterior cylinder has a circular surface area of roughly 28.3 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula suggests the larger exterior cylinder has a volume of roughly 452.4 cubic inches. Similarly, an application of the circular surface area formula suggests the smaller interior cylinder has a surface area of roughly 9.6 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula suggests the interior cylinder has a volume of roughly 153.9 cubic inches. The volume of the tube is the exterior minus the interior. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the volume of the remaining tube-like space is approximately 298.5 cubic inches. Let's check our work using the second formula, where the volume of the tube-like space is the area of the ring times the height. Substituting the previously calculated area values into the ring area formula, outer minus inner, suggests the ring-like area has a surface area of roughly 18.7 square inches. The volume of the tube is the area of the ring times height. Substituting calculated values demonstrates the volume of the remaining tube-like space is 298.5 cubic inches. Exactly the same value we calculated earlier, albeit using a different method. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence we're correct. Before we move on to unit conversions common to fluid power applications, let me make something perfectly clear. The previous example featuring ring-like surface area and tubular volume isn't a frivolous party trick for math nerds. As we'll learn in later lectures, the principal linear actuator in hydraulic and pneumatic systems, the cylinder, is cylindrical in shape, and a thorough understanding of circular area and cylindrical volume is an absolute necessity towards understanding their behavior and performance characteristics. In keeping with the theme of this lecture, consider how the act of extending 
or retracting a cylinder changes the effective area or volume exposed to pressurized fluid. When a cylinder extends, pressurized fluid acts on the full circular area and fills the completely cylindrical volume of the cap end. This should be pretty obvious, even to those with only a passing familiarity with fluid power systems. What may not be so obvious is that when a cylinder retracts, the solid rod retracts into the cylinder barrel, taking up space and volume, such that pressurized fluid does not act on a full circle, but rather a ring-like area. Additionally, the solid steel rod occupies volume, such the rod end volume is not a full cylinder, but rather a tube-like space. Get a feel for this with this cartoonish animation. When extending, fluid must fill a fully cylindrical cap and volume, and pressurized fluid acts on a fully circular area. However, when retracting, fluid fills a smaller tubular rod end volume, and pressurized fluid acts on a smaller ring-like annular rod end area. Take note of the terminology I'm using since it will be deployed for the remainder of this lecture series. Cap end, rod end. The fully cylindrical side used to extend a cylinder is called the cap or the blind end. Whereas the tubular side used to retract the cylinder is called the rod end. Not the rod, the rod end or annular end. In this spirit, try this example problem on for size. Consider a cylinder with a cap diameter of 8 inches and a travel length or height of 22 inches. When fully extended, we're dealing with ordinary circular area and ordinary cylindrical volume. However, when the cylinder retracts, it pulls a 4-inch diameter solid steel rod into the same volume. The solid steel removes effective area and volume. At full retraction, we're dealing with a ring-like area and a tubular volume. My question to you is this. What is the area and volume of the cap end at full extension? Similarly, what's the area of the ring-like rod end and the tubular volume of the rod end at full retraction? By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of the circular surface area formula suggests the fully circular cap end area has an area of roughly 50.3 square inches. An application of the cylindrical volume formula demonstrates the fully cylindrical cap end has a volume of roughly 1,105.8 cubic inches. An application of the circular surface area formula demonstrates the smaller rod, effectively this is the inner circle, has an area of roughly 12.6 square inches. The area of the annular ring-like rod end is the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the ring-like rod end has an area of roughly 37.7 square inches. Lastly, the volume of the tube-like rod end is the area of the annular ring-like rod end times the height. Substituting our calculated values demonstrates the tube-like rod end has a volume of roughly 829.4 cubic inches. All right, hopefully that went well. All right, save those answers and try this bonus problem on for size, which might be a bridge too far. Let's consider two identical cylinders with the dimensions previously calculated hooked in a series fashion where the outflow of one cylinder's rod end is the inflow of the other. We'll examine the details of series and parallel arrangements of fluid power actuators in later lectures. However, as a preview, if the downstream cylinder extends, the oil trapped in the rod end of the downstream cylinder is routed directly into the cap end of the upstream cylinder. My question to you is this. How far will the upstream cylinder extend if fluid from the downstream cylinder's rod end enters the upstream cylinder's cap end? Think about what I'm asking. A smaller volume of fluid enters a larger volume space. Will it fill it? Absolutely not. With a known quantity of fluid, 829.4 cubic inches, trapped in the upstream cylinder's rod end, entering the downstream cylinder's cap end with a known area in this case 50.3 square inches. How much will this fill the downstream cylinder's cap end, i.e. what's the height? As previously, given volume equals area over height, one could algebraically rearrange this formula to solve for unknown height, where height equals volume divided by area. 
substituting in the known volume of 829.4 cubic inches, a known area of 50.3 square inches into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates the downstream cylinder extends only 16.5 inches or roughly 75% of the full 22 inch travel length. It makes sense, right? This quantity of fluid trapped in the smaller tubular rod end in the upstream cylinder only partially fills the larger fully cylindrical cap end of the downstream cylinder. We'll examine additional examples of series and parallel connections of fluid power actuators in later lectures. Now that we've got a good understanding of the circular area and cylindrical volume formulas, let's quickly discuss unit conversions common in fluid power systems. An archaic unit commonly employed in hydraulics is the gallon, where one gallon is equivalent to 231 cubic inches. I don't know why, so don't ask me. You recall in the unit conversion lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we discussed a simple method for unit conversion whereby the quantity in question is multiplied by one, a range that the units we don't want cancel out and the units we do want remain. Consider a 55 gallon drum with a diameter 22.5 inches and a height of 33.5 inches. As we previously demonstrated, the drum has a volume of roughly 13,319.9 cubic inches. Can one really fit 55 gallons of toxic waste into this drum? Convert 55 gallons to cubic inches. 55 gallons times 231 cubic inches over 1 gallon. Units of gallons cancel out. 55 gallons is roughly equivalent to 12,705 cubic inches. Indeed we can, with plenty of room to spare. Let's try this in reverse. How many gallons can you actually fit in here? Convert 13,319.9 cubic inches to gallons. 13,319.9 cubic inches times 1 gallon over 231 cubic inches. Units of cubic inches cancel out, which demonstrates this is roughly equivalent to 57.7 gallons. All right, your turn. Consider a cylinder with a diameter of 9 inches and a height of 14 inches. Determine the volume in units of cubic inches and convert cubic inches to gallons. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should obtain the following results. The cylinder has an area of roughly 63.6 .6 square inches and a volume of roughly 890.6 cubic inches. A unit conversion demonstrates 89.6 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 3.9 gallons. Bonus round! Let's say I fill the cylinder up with 3.9 gallons of liquid and I take a smaller solid steel cylinder and drop it inside it. How much liquid spills out? How much liquid remains? Let's say the solid steel cylinder has a diameter of 3.25 inches and a height of 14 inches. Again, how much liquid spills out, how much liquid remains. Express your answer in units of gallons. Again, note gallons do not use engineering prefixes and any quantity less than one gallon must be expressed as a fractional or decimal equivalent. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. The solid steel cylinder has an area of roughly 8.3 square inches and a volume of roughly 116.7 cubic inches. This means 116.1 .1 cubic inches of the original 890.6 cubic inches spills out the floor and 890 minus 116 or roughly 774.5 cubic inches remains. All we got to do is convert these values to gallons. A unit conversion demonstrates 116.1 .1 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 0.5 gallons. Another unit conversion demonstrates 774.5 cubic inches is roughly equivalent to 3.5 gallons. There you have it circular area, cylindrical volume, and unit conversion. I do believe we've accomplished what we set out to do and could bring this lecture to a close. Just kidding. One more set of examples before I cut you loose. Lest you think all circular area and cylindrical volume calculations feature archaic units of inches, let's do a couple of quick calculations featuring metric units. Really nothing changes as long as you remain consistent. As we demonstrated with US customer units, given diameter in inches, one expresses area in square inches and volume in cubic inches. Metric units are no different. Given diameter in centimeters, area is expressed in square centimeters and volume in cubic centimeters. Similarly, given diameter meter, area is expressed in square meter and volume in cubic meters and so on. I should also mention the liter is a unit of volume, where a liter is a cube with dimensions of 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters or 0.1 meters by 0.1 meters by 0.1 meters. Conversion is relatively easy using the metric system where one cubic meter 
is equivalent to a thousand liters. Let's try a couple quick metric examples and call it a day. Consider an industrial wind turbine generator with a 116 meter rotor diameter. Solve for area in units of meter squared. Too easy. Area is pi over 4 times diameter squared. Substituting given diameter into the circular surface area equation suggests this wind turbine rotor has a surface area of roughly 10,568.3 square meters. This is sometimes called the rotor swept area or RSA. And it's a measure of how much wind this turbine can capture. Turbines with longer blades have larger diameters and thus larger areas and are consequently exposed to more wind. Case in point, consider another turbine, however this one is designed for low wind areas. Each blade is 8 meters longer, resulting in an increased rotor diameter of 132 meters. How does this relatively small increase in blade length affect rotor swept area? Substituting the given diameter into the circular surface area equation suggests this new larger wind turbine rotor has a surface area of roughly 13,684.8 square meters. A relatively small 8 meter extension of each blade has resulted in more than 3,000 square meters of additional RSA. Alright, that's that. In conclusion, this lecture introduced circular area and cylindrical volume calculations and explored how these calculations are commonly employed in fluid power systems. Additionally, we learned how to convert cubic inches to gallons and vice versa. Lastly, we learned how to perform area calculations using metric units. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your Lazy Lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.